Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Nathan Thompson with the Wellness Way Yorkville. Happy Monday uh, evening, guys. I sincerely appreciate you joining us on there. I know we have a lot of people watching right now. And if you are joining us on Facebook, on YouTube, if you're joining us on any platform, just make sure that you say hello, give me a wave and let me know where you're watching from as well. I always love to see where people uh, are watching from. And also, if you can hear me, okay, make sure you give me a thumbs up, okay? All right, guys, we're going to go over something really, really interesting that affects a lot of people, um, and it has to do with neuropathy, okay? So a pathological condition of your nerves that has a lot to do with um, feet pain, uh, arm pain, hand pain, you know, things like that. I'm going to talk to you one of the biggest reasons for neuropathy, and I know what you're thinking, that it's all just chemical. This could also be physical as well. So let's talk about neuropathy. I'm going to move very quickly through here and also make sure that you watch it all the way to the end because one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a solution. I'm going to give you a code so that you can start working on this um, right away, especially if you're someone who, who deals with neuropathy. Make sure if you know anybody who deals with neuropathy, make sure you please share this video um, as well because I'm going to go over some solutions some some very tangible solutions and also some pretty awesome research in regards to that uh, as well. So let's uh, get into it, okay? Now, before we do that, one of the things I wanna make sure that, that um, while you're listening to this, you're like, oh my goodness, I need someone to guide me and move me in the right direction. Our next inflammation talk is gonna be on Tuesday, March 12th. The reason why it's on a Tuesday is because it's leap year. So we have an extra day in February, hooray. <laughs> um, at six o'clock, this is an in-person event. You can go to, if you're watching on Instagram, you go to the top of the page and register for that in-person inflammation event. Guys, this is where uh, we actually take new patients. We had six people who called in today wanting to be new patients and we're like, hey, just get to the inflammation talk. And the reason why, guys, is it bridges the gap between what you need to do and where you're starting from. And that's one of the things that we want to help you do, especially when it comes to healthcare, is that people are so frustrated with healthcare. We want to help bridge the gap in between them. So our next in-person event, if you are from the Chicagoland area, make sure that you get uh, registered for the our next inflammation talk that is in person, Tuesday, March 12th at 6 o'clock p.m. sharp. We start sharply, promptly at six o'clock, no excuses as well. And if you are watching from outside of the Chicagoland area, but you're still within the, the, the continental 48 states, you can also watch the webinar. And these are for people who want to work with me remotely. What do you mean by remotely? Well, this is going to be over the phone. And if you watch that inflammation webinar, you're going to see um, a link towards it as you get to the end. And that'll be an opportunity to be able to schedule a discovery call with me uh, with our uh, scheduling, our Calendly scheduling system, okay? And yes, you will talk to me in person. I just got off the phone with a wonderful, wonderful woman, so, so kind-hearted, and it just broke my heart to what she went through. But she had sent me an email, and she said, please help me with my son's inflammatory dumpster fire. <laughs> And I looked through all of his labs and I'm like, where's the rest of it? Where's the rest of it? I said, hey, they're doing such complex things. They're never giving you any answers. Your son's been so inflamed for so long. Then maybe what we should do is take a step back and actually look at where inflammation is actually coming from. So he's, he's had success, a setback, success, set, a setback. And so, um, and that's why we just had to kind of scale back and say, hey, Rather than take 22 supplements and, and your son's still sick, let's actually test some things and not cause the inflammation. And she paused. You know what she said? She said, huh, it just seems like I, that for some reason I keep putting like a log onto this um, inflammatory fire and I'm just fueling it sometimes. And that's where you have to know what inflammation is, where it's actually coming from. And so when she was done, she was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. So please, if you're from the contiguous 48 states, you want to work with, work with, um, work with me specifically remotely, go watch the uh, inflammation webinar, register for it. You'll see a link at the end to be able to register for a discovery call with me. Yes, that's me in person. I'm also going to tell you this, is that this is going to be limited time. 
I'm not going to be doing this forever. So as the spots fill up, I just, I'll take it off. So if you have been farting around for a long period of time, this is your chance. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be your chance. Make sure you do it because it won't be around forever. I will promise you that it won't be around uh, forever. So if you see it go away down the road, one of the reasons why is, is just because of uh, scheduling and availability and things like that. So make sure that you make sure that you register for that um, and schedule that um, discovery call with me as quickly as possible. We always love doing challenges and help to improve your life. And coming up um, at the beginning of March, we're going to be kicking off our March You Don't Know Squat Challenge. All right. So the You Don't Know Squat Challenge, and we're going to be helping you to work on mobility. Here's the thing with developing mobility. You just have to do the right things, do it over and over and over again in order to get the tissues to respond. So we're going to talk about how to improve your squat by developing mobility in your hips, your knees, your ankles, um, and then also how to get mobility back in the spine and the things, ne the joints necessary to be able to have a great squat. We also, if you guys go to our bonfire page, a couple of weeks ago, we ordered $150 of gift certificates for people and gave them a bunch of stuff on our bonfire so that they could get a t-shirt. And if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or um, Rumble, you're going to see that we have an awesome t-shirt and it says, you don't know squat. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who can't squat. And I'm like, please know squat. Please know how to do a squat as well. In fact, my son just got the t-shirt and was wearing it. He's like, dad, this is the most awesome t-shirt I've ever seen. So uh, we have a lot of awesome t-shirts on our bonfire page in order to support our cause, in order to support us doing challenges every single month. We've already done a meats and veggie only challenge. We've done a five minutes of fire. Now we're going to be doing squat things to help improve your life. Especially when we talk about neuropathy, this one's going to be very, very important, has everything to do with that, especially. So let's talk about neuropathy. All right. The first thing that I want you guys to understand, I talk about this. Here's how we think. We think differently. And this is a little bit of insider information in regards to our inflammation talk that we do, whether it's a webinar or in person. But when you are sick, Doc, why am I sick? then there's something that's stressing the body, guys. And this is actually the whole principle of chiropractic. The whole principle of chiropractic says this, that the body is biologically programmed to be healthy and to adapt. And if you're sick, then there's an overabundance of stressors that are taking place that the body cannot adapt appropriately to. Where are these stressors actually coming from? They're coming from either mental stress, they're coming from chemical inflammation, or they're coming from actual physical inflammation on the spine and the nerve system. This is why even taking physical stressors off the spine and the nerve system, and people are like, oh, my reflux went away, or my blood sugars got better, or I was able to get pregnant. What kind of witchcraft are you doing? And it's like the body's designed to be well, and um, taking physical stressors off removes a major stressor that allows the body to do this. Oh, and as you take stressors and remove stressors and remove them away, things get better. I was just talking to a wonderful young woman today on an in-person consult. This woman had so much skin issues and eczema and things like that. And her skin has magically cleared up and she's doing so much better. She's like, my skin has cleared up. My bloating is gone. I'm sleeping so much better. And my menstrual cycle has actually normalized. I'm like, huh? I guess that's what happens when you take a lot of inflammatory stressors off of the body. So when you're, if you're sick, you have to ask yourself, do I have a lot of mental stress? Uh, do I have chemical inflammation that's taking place? And we're talking a lot about the gastrointestinal system. Do I have a lot of physical stressors that are taking place too? That's on the spine and nerve system. That's why you see so many things change, especially after a big time injury, concussive type injury, neck injury, car accident, bad fall, things like that because it changes so many different things. So always take that 3,000, 30,000 foot view, look back and say, where can, where's my body not adapting very well? Is it chemical, is it physical, or is it um, mental? Um, and this is why mental stress affects women so much. This is why we talk so much about this, how it affects hormones, especially at our inflammation talk. This is why guys, I keep saying, get to the inflammation talk because it's so, so stinking important, especially. So let's get into neuropathy, okay? 
if you have any kind of neuropathy, it's important to ask these questions. Number one, what do your x-rays look like? Especially if you have neuropathy in your hands, if you're having carpal tunnel type symptoms, carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms, um, or any kind of neuropathy, especially if you're talking about in your feet and things like that, what do your x-rays look like? Here's another question. Where are your blood sugars or your hemoglobin A1C? Where is that at? And then number three, how much inflammation is actually present? And a lot of times you'll be like, ah, uh, I, I don't know. I'm going to give you an example. Here's an x-ray, a, a lateral cervical x-ray of an individual uh, that I took. And one of the things that you can see, here's the eyes, here's the teeth, here's the back of the head. And you can see that I got rid of any personal identification or anything like that. The black line is where he's at and the red line is normal. And you can see massive loss occurs with stretches, damages the spinal cord can cause neurological deterioration. You can see that a spine uh, is actually calcifying because it's inflamed. It's not in the right uh, position, which is damaging the discs. And that can actually cause a lot of pain why my hands hurt. I don't have very good grip strength in my left hand. He's like, this has been going on for, you know, about 25 years, but I've never, ever gotten it corrected. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> um, so you need to know what your neck x-rays and your lower back x-rays look like. Here's a lower back x-ray of someone who recently came in and he had a lot of reflux and a lot of joint pain. Now, let me look at this. This is his left hip. Here's his right hip. And when you look at this, look at that gastric bubble. Look at how big his stomach is. And then look, if you look in his um, small, large intestines, how much gastric gas you actually see. That's an indication of a lot of inflammation, okay? That's a sign of a lot of inflammation, which means that his gastrointestinal system's not doing very well, just like mine was in 25 years ago, which is why I had so much chronic inflammation, joint pain, things like that a long time ago because uh, my gastrointestinal system was not doing very well. Um, and you can see he's probably suffering tremendously, not having enough stomach acid. And as a result, he probably has de developed some kind of like either yeast or some kind of um, um, bacterial overgrowth within the intestines as a result. Now we're gonna test this too down the road. We're not just guessing, say, hey, just take a bunch of supplements. One of the things that we're saying is let's test this so we know what to do. And in fact, I went over a new stool test with a young boy today. His, tools, his stool test score was almost 40, I believe. This is coming from memory. We redid the stool test and it went from 40 down to about 10. And I'm like, according to this, your um, eczema should be improving. And he pulled his um, he pulled his leg up. He's like, yes, it is. Look at how much smaller it's actually getting. And you can see how, see how these eczema patches are actually starting to heal. So the, one of the things that's important is, is you need to know what your blood sugars are at, but you also need to know what do your x-rays look like as well. The reason why I talk about blood sugars has to do with this is because chronically elevated blood sugars will destroy your soft tissues. They destroy your soft tissues. If you ever have heard of cataracts, soft tissue causes destruction of the lens, which leads to clouding and cataracts. Okay. So one of the things that elevated blood sugars leads to is known as ages or advanced glycation end stages. And here's the main thing. Glucose um, binds, when you have a high amount of blood glucose, it binds to proteins like collagen or anything with that's soft tissue. That's why if you have elevated blood sugars, it can bind to collagen and it can destroy anything with collagen in it. So what is that going to uh, what what does that include? That includes your vascular system. So why people have type two diabetes, why they're like, yeah, you're gonna have an elevation of heart disease and stroke and things like that. It damages the kidneys. Why do you think there are so many um, uh, like medical renal centers <laughs> that are out there because of the number of type two diabetics? It reduces skin elast elasticity big time, which means it will cause you to look older if you have elevated blood sugar. So think of how it damages the skin, um, damages the, the, um, the, uh, kidneys, um, and it can damage the vascular lining too, uh, which can cause a lot of problems with atherosclerosis and things like that. It can also damage the brain. 
um, which is why you've ever heard of type three diabetes or diabetes brain. You know, people have brain shrinkage with elevated blood sugars. Um, and it can also cause a lot of PCOS type symptoms as well. So if you have a high, uh, high blood sugars, um, and one of the things that will do is that will interfere quite a bit. And this is why they, when they look at uh, someone who has PCOS, this is why they look at your blood sugars. If you're type two diabetic, and they're also looking at testosterone, uh, markers as well, which interfere with the ovulatory process. So if you would talk about where should my A1C, which is your 90 day blood sugar average, basically, where should your A1C be at? Where it really should be at is 5.2 or under. And that's why if you look at the journal of neurology to talk about 5.3 or above causes accelerated brain deterioration or brain atrophy. So that's why you really have to pay attention to your blood sugars because it can cause so many other problems. So getting into neuropathies, I wanna go over with you uh, some really, really interesting research. Some of them's gonna just absolutely just, your eyes are gonna be open and you're just gonna, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. So this comes from Clinical Experimental Metabolism. This is a fairly new article, July, 2023, not even a year old. And it talks about the association between diabetes and thiamine status, a systemic review and meta-analysis, okay? Now, here's what they say in regards to um, thiamine, which is actually vitamin B1, okay? So I, I kind of gave away the, the, uh, the clue, okay? Now, thiamine or vitamin B1 is an essential cofactor in glucose metabolism. Um, and from this uh, study, the conclusion is, Diabetes is associated with lower levels of various thiamine markers, suggesting that individuals with diabetes may have higher thiamine requirements than those without diabetes. Now listen to this, but well-designed studies are required to confirm these findings. Make sure you pay attention to this because I'm going to go over this in just a second. Um, this was an article that came out of PubMed, um, Acta Diabetologica, um, and this is fairly new too. This is not even three years old um, as well. And it's called Thiamine and Diabetes, Back to the Future. And here's what they say. The first reports of a link between thiamine, thiamine and diabetes date back to the 1940s. Some years later, a role for thiamine deficiency in diabetic neuropathy became evident. The first evidence of the beneficial effects of thiamine on microvascular cells involved in diabetic complications dates to 1996. Now, here's what's interesting. Thiamine is a water-soluble vitamin rapidly, rapidly expelled from the body with no issues of overdosage or accumulation. This is not similar to vitamin A, D, E, and K, which are fat-soluble that your body can actually store. Yes, you can have too high of vitamin A. You can have too high, too high of vitamin D as well. Um, so it's rapidly expelled from the body, no issues of overdosage or accumulation. Unfortunately, now listen to this, it is non-patentable and neither industry nor independent donors are interested in investing in large scale randomized control clinical trials to investigate its potential in diabetes and complications. Isn't that interesting, huh? Ah, interesting. Can you imagine that this potentially could be a cure, but they don't want to do a scientific study because you can't produce a drug out of it, okay? Which leads me to this. Who pays for the science? Who pays for the science? You know who pays for the science? Those interested in making a profit from it. And I call this the impenetrable wall of evidence-based science. Let me divulge for just a little bit or take a little bit of a tangent. I'm going to kind of uh, give you my thoughts in regards to this. Do you know people who are like, I'm only evidence-based? <laughs> and I'm like, no, you should be physiologically based, <laughs> actually. Just know your physiology um, because they can't find enough studies to do it because they're, people don't want to pay for it because they're like, if I invest in this expensive study, can we get a drug out of it that I can actually make money from? And you can't because you can't patent thiamine, vitamin B1, you can't patent, you can't make a drug out of it. So no one wants to invest in actual research as well. So how do you get evidence-based science? You have to be able to make a drug out of it so people will want to uh, actually invest in the random con randomly controlled study. They want, to, they want to make their money back. And that's why pharmaceutical companies 
have a fiduciary responsibility um, of making money to their investors. And that's why they're not interested in anything that they can't make a drug out of, especially, okay? So let's go a little bit deeper. The first vitamin, thiamine, vitamin B1, is a water-soluble vitamin belonging to the B group, the first to be isolated in 1926. It is an essential cofactor of glucose metabolism in almost all living organisms, including people. Yes, it includes people, humans. Now listen to this. Low thiamine levels are often associated with diabetes. Okay. Now, I want you to think about this because now what I'm going to talk about is if you have a severe deficiency of thiamine, you're going to have something known as beriberi, B-E-R-I-B-E-R-I, known as beriberi. Um, now, here's the interesting thing is this, is that there's really not a blood test that you can diagnose this you know, as well, but there's a, lot, there's a lot of physical symptoms with beriberi. Beriberi is a deficiency of thiamine, more commonly known as vitamin B1. Beriberi can affect the cardiovascular system or the central nerve system. Now, who's at most risk for beriberi, okay? Which also can be having a severe thiamine deficiency. People who drink a lot of alcohol or who struggle with alcohol addiction are more likely to be deficient in thiamine. Excess alcohol can interfere with the body's ability to absorb thiamine. So, um, but what's interesting is it's you know it's like they always say you either have it or you don't and i'm like but what if you're like kind of there and they're like well i guess you're just it, then it doesn't matter it's like it's like saying yeah you're pre-diabetic we're just gonna watch it and i'm like watch it do what get worse so who are at risk those who eat now listen to this a high carbohydrate diet especially refined carbs people engaged in extremely high amounts of physical activity or exercise People with certain digestive problems can interfere with nutrient absorption, particularly as they age. I use that term loosely. Or people who have had bariatric surgery for weight loss. I've talked a lot about this in, on various reels. But you remember these like Mercedes 80s doctors rocking around being like, you're overweight, bariatric surgery. You're overweight, you get bariatric surgery. And they were just basically just... Um, selling this for whoever wanted to get bariatric surgery. But the thing is, is anytime that you're messing with the stomach, you're decreasing the volume of the stomach, you're stapling the stomach, you're rerouting the stomach, whatever, however they're doing it, is that you're going to deal with a lot of nutrient deficiencies, especially. That's why if you look at bariatric surgery, why there's a higher incidence of gallbladder disease, why there could be a higher incidence of um, anemia because you need stomach acid. You need a stomach in order to be able to absorb iron. Um, and that's also why um, I even asked a gastrointestinal surgeon who did this. And I'm like, isn't there a higher incidence of cancers? He's like, yes, but the evidence is unclear. I'm like, who on earth is going to pay for that study? <laughs> They're like, yeah, probably uh, yeah, all the gastric surgeons are like, yeah, we'll pay for that study to see if it causes an increase in cancer. I, it's not a study that I'd be super um, interested if I was a, a bypass, gastric bypass type surgeon. So people have had bariatric surgery for weight loss, and I've seen more problems than it actually has helped, which is why most people need a revision of it. I'm like, if you need to revise that or you need to redo it, then chances are you shouldn't have done it the first time or anyone with high levels of stress. Now it goes by, back to physical, chemical, and mental. High levels of stress can have beriberi, okay? So now, going back off that same research article, the title of it is Thiamine and Diabetic Neuropathy, okay? Thiamine was first isolated by Jansen and Donath in 1926. It was soon hypothesized that thiamine could be of help for those for the treatment of diabetic neuropathy, the first hypothesis of such indication dates back to 1954. Several subsequent reports confirmed that neuropathic symptoms and deficits and nerve conduction velocity were significantly improved by thiamine or benfotiamine, which is a synthetic derivative of thiamine administration in subjects with diabetic neuropathy. Um, thiamine and microvascular complications of diabetes. In 1996, LaSelva and co-workers demonstrated that thiamine 
neutralizes the damaging effects of high glucose concentration in cultured endothelial cells, lowering lactate production and advanced glycation end stages formation and preserving cell replication. So we know that it plays a role in advanced glycation end stages. Now, here's what's also interesting as you keep going through the through this article, and they say old drugs and the impenetrable wall of evidence-based medicine. <laughs> All right, so here's what they say. Stick with me in regards to that because this will leave your head shaking. Over the last 80 years, a relevant amount of work in vitro or in a test tube and in animal models has strongly suggested that thiamine supplementation may exert beneficial effects on the pathological mechanisms of diabetes and its complications. Most studies conclude by stressing the need for large structured clinical trials to test the vitamin as a potential and inexpensive option, that's why they don't wanna do the tests, to prevent or slow down the progression of diabetes and its complications. However, these wishes never materialized. One problem with the tenets of evidence-based medicine is that Apart from its undeniable advantages, it requires the completion of proper RCTs or random, con random controlled trials to gain registration for new indications. This approach is rightly reserved for new molecules where the enormous investments for their development are justified by the prospect of higher returns. Although fully appropriate to leave old fashioned practices behind and identify adverse effects, this effectively blocks the, the way to new indications for old medicines. Why don't they wanna use old medicines? And in fact, thiamine is not even a medicine, it's a vitamin. Why do they not wanna use it? Because over time it becomes generic and now they don't have the money making opportunity that they once had including uh, uh, the uh, blocks the way to new indications for old medicines, including thymine and its derivatives and RCT to test their activity in diabetic complications would require, now listen to this, uh, the enrollment of thousands of patients, at least four year follow-up and sophisticated methods to centrally assess retinopathy, nephropathy or, or um, uh, kidney issues and neuropathy as thiamine is non-patentable and inexpensive, it will be immensely difficult to raise the funds to run such trials. Interesting enough, this is why if, if something can't be patented and they can't make a bunch of money, they're not interested in actually running the trials, it has nothing to do with human health, has everything to do with making money from it, okay? Um, thiamine deficiency disorder is a clinical perspective, all right? So this is an article from 2021. Thiamine deficiency presents many challenges to clinicians, in part due to the broad clinical spectrum referred to as thiamine deficiency disorders, or TDDs, affecting the metabolic, neurologic, cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, and musculoskeletal systems. Now, TDDs, or thiamine deficiency disorders, are frequently misdiagnosed and treatment opportunities are missed with fatal consequences or permanent neurologic uh, sequela. In the absence of specific diagnostic tests, a low threshold of clinical suspicion and early therapeutic thymine is currently the best approach. Even in severe cases, rapid clinical improvement can occur within hours or days with neurological involvement, possibly requiring higher doses and a longer recovery time. So let me ask you a question. If you do have um, type two diabetes and you have neuropathy and you have a doctor who's in charge, did they ever consider thymine as something to help you? And if they haven't, then all they do is they just follow just their list of requirements. And if they're not offering anything, um, in regards to nutrition, other than to eat better and exercise more, let me tell you something, please find a new doctor. Um, if you want to be disappointed guys in medicine, get sick. And you'll realize that the answers that they have for you is only following just a list of things. And there's very few doctors who are willing to actually research this and think out the box. And I spent four hours um, last week looking at all of these different things. So the first vitamin, um, thiamine is a water-soluble vitamin belonging to the B group, the first to be isolated in 1926. As all water-soluble vitamins, 
is rapidly expelled through the urinary system. And I know that someone's going to ask me, can I take too much of it? Does not accumulate in the body and has no toxic effects. Nonetheless, it's an essential cofactor of glucose metabolisms in almost all living organism and a modulator of neuronal and neuromuscular transmission in vertebrates, people who have a spine, <laughs> especially. Alcoholics are often thiamine deficient, mainly because of the impairing effects of chronic alcohol intake on intestinal uh, absorptive uh, mechanisms. Low thiamine levels are often associated with type 2 diabetes. Now, here's another article that comes from PubMed. Um, this is relatively recent, about um, three years old, almost three years old. High dose vitamin B1 therapy prevents the development of experimental fatty liver driven by overnutrition. Now we're even talking about fatty liver. Fatty liver, what is it? It's an abnormal metabolic condition of excess intrahepatic fat. So it's exactly what it sounds like. You have a lot of fat within your liver. What drives it? We thought it was alcohol. It used to be alcohol. Now it's just what we would call overnutrition. The overconsumption of especially carb-heavy food, hyperpalatable food that contains tons of carbs, tons of fat, and it's just, you know, hyperpalatable food is like, it's only this big and it's got 1,200 calories in it. This is why I've talked about this on Liza. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch this. Um, because there's a difference between a plate of broccoli and a plate of Oreos. You have a, you have a plate of broccoli and you feel full. You don't really want any more. If you have a plate of Oreos, you want to eat another plate of Oreos. Uh, they're not going to be as filling as well. But the plate of Oreos is going to have 1,800 calories in it. The plate of broccoli is going to have probably 180. So fatty liver and thiamine. Um, now, the most prevalent form in humans is non-alcoholic fatty liver generally develops due to overnutrition and a sedentary lifestyle and has no approved drug therapy, okay? If you have a fatty liver, doctors can't give you a drug for it. Here we tested the hypothesis that treatment with thiamine, vitamin B1, can counter the development of hepatic uh, steatosis or fatty liver driven by overnutrition. Thiamine treatment also decreased hyperglycemia or your blood sugars and increase the glycogen content of the liver, but it did not improve insulin sensitivity, suggesting that fatty liver could be addressed independently of targeting insulin resistance. Thiamine increased the catalytic, catalytic capacity for hepatic oxidation of carbohydrates and fatty acids. This discovery of the potent anti-fatty liver effect of thiamine may prove clinically useful in managing fatty liver disorders. We got a fatty liver. How many of you are actually taking thiamine? Correlation of fasting blood sugar and glycated hemoglobin A1C with thiamine levels in diabetic patients. This was a study that they actually did. And it says, it's been discovered that low levels of thiamine reserves in the body are related to diabetes mellitus because thiamine directly influences carbohydrate metabolism. We recommend that serum thiamine levels be routinely monitored in diabetic patients and thiamine supplementation should be considered to avoid complications, especially vascular complications of, um, of diabetes mellitus. Now, here's another one. Uh, benfotiamine in the treatment of diabetic polyneuropathy. Polyneuropathy meaning I have neuropathy in, in many different places. A three-week randomized control pilot study and here's actually what they find. Just so you know, benfotiamine is actually the, it's it's um, not a natural source of thiamine. So I always always want to get the thiamine from food sources and things like that, not things that are that are made in the lab. However, you still see some improvement. Now, what they found is a, st a statistically significant improvement in the neuropathy score was observed in the group given this active drug when compared to the placebo treated controls there was no complaint there was no statistically significant change observed in the tuning fork test i mean they didn't feel certain vibrations necessarily better but they actually had a lot of decreased pain the most pronounced effect on um, complaints was a decrease in pain now here's the here's the the biggest thing that i want to tell you the difference between the groups cannot be attributed to a change in metabolic parameters since there was no significant alterations in hemoglobin A1C, 
which you're not going to see in a three week study. You're not going to see huge changes and blood sugar profiles. The body mass index of the two groups did not differ. Conclusion, this pilot investigation has confirmed the results of two earlier randomized controlled trials and has provided further evidence for the beneficial effects of bento, of benfotiamine in patients with diabetic neuropathy. So B1 and thiamine, okay? The multifaceted therapeutic uh, potential for benfotiamine. Um, thiamine, known as vitamin B1, plays an essential role in energy metabolism. Uh, benfotiamine is a synthetic S um, acetyl derivative of thiamine. Uh, benfotiamine administration increases the levels of intracellular thiamine um, and um, a cofactor necessary for the activation uh, transketolase, uh, resulting in the reduction of tissue level of advanced glycation end stages. The elevated level of ages has been implicated in the reduction progression of diabetes associated complications. Chronic hyperglycemia accelerates the reaction between glucose and proteins, leading to the formation of advanced glycation end stages, uh, which form irreversible cross links with many macromolecules such as collagen in diabetes. Uh, advanced glycation end stages accumulate in tissues at an accelerated rate. This is why with type uh, 2 diabetes and, and blood sugars that are not controlled, they'll first try to control it with drugs and eventually that won't work anymore. Why it causes so many problems. This is why people are so inflamed because it's damaging the connective tissue and that damaged tissue is going to force an immune system response. Okay. Now, I want to tell you guys this. This is one of the biggest things. If you have di type 2 diabetes or if you have insulin resistance, how do you know you got to get it measured? Your B1, your thiamine demands are more, okay? So if you have type 2 diabetes or if you have insulin resistance, you're going to have an increase in thiamine demands. This is why we talk about the Swiss watch principle. We talk a lot of it about it um, in the inflammation talk is how everything affects everything. Um, and if you have problems with blood sugar, chances are you're probably going to need to build more muscle. Um, chances are you probably have a lot of skin issues as well. Um, chances are you probably have a lot of digestive issues as well. Chances are if you're type 2 diabetic, you probably have low, if you're a man, you have low testosterone. Um, women, you're probably having a heck of a time when it comes to menopause as well. You're also going to have a problem with the circulatory system. Um, and this is what just gets me is that if you have a problem with your skin, you're going to go to a dermatologist who's only going to look at the skin, who's going to give you a medication that's going to manipulate the response happening at the skin. If the skin clears up, they're like, we're amazing. We did our job. But they're not going to look at where it's actually coming from. That's why when you look at any kind of disease or anything, it's multifactorial and you have to start addressing the multiple factors when it comes to that. Um, and you have to start looking at the body as a Swiss watch. So when people say, hey, what's the root cause of this? I'm like, there's a lot. There's not just one root cause to any kind of disease. There's not one root cause when it comes to cancer. There's not one root cause to really anything. There's multiple things that have to go wrong. And a lot of what we're dealing with is the body trying to adapt to all of those different things that are going on. But we go from, we just keep going from specialist to specialist to specialist. I'm going to say something. I hope it's funny to you. You know what a specialist is? Someone who knows more and more about less and less until finally they're experts in nothing. <laughs> a specialist is someone who knows more and more about less and less until finally they're experts in nothing. And this is what, and this is what I, I chuckle a little bit. I, I, I'm also sad because in people in their pursuit of trying to get better, they run to the specialist and they're like, you know what? We're going to go to Mayo Clinic. <laughs> and Mayo Clinic, they're great diagnosticians. They diagnose things, but you know what? The answer is always the same. The answer is just another drug, um, which is why I've had Mayo Clinic call me up and they're like, what did you do? Is some kind of sorcery or witchcraft or something like that? And I was like, just keep watching more lives. You'll, get a, you'll figure it out. So if you have neuropathy, I want you to think of this, is that you have a, you have a thiamine deficiency. Your demands are more if you are having some blood sugar issues. And the thiamine affects the nerve system greatly. So what are some dietary sources of B1? Okay. So there's veggies, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, spinach, beet greens, um, eggplants, um, 
Even some fruits have vitamin B1. Oranges, pineapple, grapefruit, cantaloupe, watermelon, apples. I prefer to get it from low glycemic vegetables, especially if you are diabetic, and to get it from meat, poultry, and seafood like pork chops, chicken meat, beef liver. I love beef liver, salmon, oysters, clams, um, legumes and seeds, flax seeds, sunflower seeds, uh, edamame, sesame seeds, chickpeas, black beans. And then you have some other sources like brown rice. This is why, guys, um, white rice doesn't have much nutritional content in it, especially as you're talking about polished rice. So brown rice, yogurt, wheat germs, cereals, brewer's yeast, and even tofu. But here's what you have to make sure, guys, that you are taking into account is that some of these, just because they have thymine, they're not that good for you, especially if you have elevated A1C, which is why we'll say, don't eat these, get these sources instead. Um, if someone's got elevated um, average blood sugars or elevated A1C. Now, the other thing is too, is from this list, there's a lot of things that you can have an IgG mediated food allergy too, which means that you can have it and this food can become a poison. This food can become a toxin for you. It's not going to make you feel very good. Uh, specifically things like wheat germ, um, brewer's yeast, uh, rice, uh, things like that. You can have a response to. And if you did, if you got diabetic from eating a lot of that, you probably do in fact have an allergy to it um, as well. So this is why testing, guys, is so important. This is also why taking a highly individualized approach to your health makes all the difference um, because you're not just a, a flow chart. You're not just, oh, just start eating better or just start exercising. That's why I will give very specific exercise advice to people. I give very highly individualized nutrition advice uh, to people as well. And the reason why is because we have the testing to back all of that up. So what are probably the best sources of getting enough thymine in? This is where I'm going to share with you a little, little secret, okay? So some of the best sources are going to be liver, okay? Liver, organ meat. That's why who gets liver glandular in my office? Almost everybody, unless they're willing to, to eat it, you know, have liver worst or be able to have, eat you know, regular liver and cut it with ground beef. Um, if they're willing to eat liver, we're like, okay, make sure you're getting five to six ounces of it per week. Liver glandular is very high in, in uh, you know, B9, B12. It's high in CoQ10. It's high in selenium, zinc, microminerals, you know, things like that. That's why liver is so good for you. And no, it's not toxic to eat because it doesn't store toxins. Liver doesn't store toxins, okay? Fat stores toxins. But then there's another thing that we have too, and it's called wellness B complex, wellness B complex. And if you look on here, you can see that just wellness B complex just by itself has 1,250% of thiamine uh, per day. 15 milligrams is 1,250%. And remember, you don't store this because it's water soluble. So taking high, higher doses of it is going to be okay. So I know that a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, where can I get this from? I'm like, okay, here's where this, here's, this is something I never do. Um, go to store.thewellnessway.com. If you are watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see this. Facebook, you'll see it. Rumble, you'll be able to see it. Go to store.thewellnessway.com. You'll be able to order it there. And to be able to access that, once you create an account to access some of these things, if you use the, this code 5058, then it'll say, okay, that's okay. Dr. Thompson recommended that for you. So it's good. We're good. Okay. So that's how you access with that code, but please don't, um, please don't overuse that. Okay. It's code five zero. Don't, don't overuse it. I only want you getting liver or wellness B, especially if you have diabetic neuropathies and things like that. Okay. But wait, before you decide, I'm going to go run out and get that because that's the next thing that I can start supplementing with. You know what I would rather have you do instead? Get your sugars down. Work on getting your blood sugars down. What's some of the best ways in order to do that? A no sugar diet. Um, we This is one of the challenges that we did. It was called meats and veggies only. Is it a meat? Yes. Is it a veggie? Okay. Then it's going to be good for you. There's not going to be a lot of sugar that's in it. Um, also, one of the things I love to do the best, if you follow me on uh, Instagram or on Facebook, I post a lot of my workouts, which is high intensity, short duration type exercise. 
And the reason why high intensity short duration exercise is absolutely phenomenal is it doesn't take a lot of time, but also what you're blowing through is actually your available stored sugars as well. And then another thing that you can do to help get your sugars down is start building muscle, start building muscle. Where's the best place in order to build muscle where you have the largest muscles, which is going to be the thighs, the butt and the back. This is why I love squatting. Like you don't know squat challenge coming up. This is why I love squatting. This is why I love deadlifting. If you want to put a lot of muscle mass on squatting, deadlifting, pressing are some of the best places in order to put muscle on more muscle mass that you have the less insulin resistant that you're going to be. So this is why doing all of those things are so important. But you know how many times I say, hey, you know what? If you have osteoporosis, I want you to start putting on some muscle mass. And they're like, oh man, that sounds hard. And I'm like, it is hard, but you got to start somewhere. If that's what your goal is, don't tell me you don't want to do your goal. <laughs> so get your sugars down. Otherwise you're just, you're, you're, Trying to outrun a deficiency is very hard to do. Get your sugars down and help your nerve system to be able to recover. No sugar diet, high intensity, short duration exercise, and start building muscle as well. Okay. Now I'm going to go over a really interesting point. It's controversial, uh, but let me explain this a little bit, uh, a little bit further. You'd be dead if you didn't have type two diabetes. You'd be dead. Insulin resistance is an adaptation and it's been warning you for years. You just don't wake up one day and you're like, I have type two diabetes. How did I get that? It just jumped inside my body and I developed type two diabetes. This is true with any disease. Your body will warn you for years before you have some kind of problem. And when I say you'd be dead if you didn't have type two diabetes. And the reason why is this, because the average American consumes so much sugar, so much sugar that an adaptive response of the body is to develop insulin resistance because if it can't bring those sugars in, it can't continue to damage the cell. If you feed the, a cell tons of sugar, you're gonna get a lot of oxidative damage. However, there's one organ system that doesn't become insulin resistant. You know what organ system that is? Your nerve system. And why do you think the first thing that, that starts to that starts to have massive blood sugar issues is actually your nerve system and some of your nerve system starts to get damaged, starts dying off, which is why you have um, diabetic neuropathies and things like that. Um, and that's why um, the nerve system is not something that, that can become insulin resistant. But think of this, your body doesn't become insulin resistant overnight. It takes years to develop type two diabetes. Your body is trying to warn you. And the thing is, is this, is your doctor testing these things properly? Are they testing these things properly? Because if you've been using the same doctor and all of a sudden he says, now you're diabetic, it's time to find a new doctor because they haven't been listening to the warning signs taking place inside of the body. Okay. So here's what you guys need to do before you run out and you want to get, uh, start to consume a bunch of thiamine, which if you are, do have, um, uh, some kind of neuropathy, then yes, I think that that would be beneficial for you as well, but here's what to do. Number one, work with a wellness way doctor, okay? Work with a wellness way doctor, address the inflammatory stress of what happens with high blood sugar. And then number three, work with a wellness way doctor. <laughs> I have to say it twice just to remind you guys as well. And I wanna leave you guys with this. On the journey towards health, it's okay to ask for directions, okay? It's okay to ask for directions. You're not admitting defeat by asking for directions. And this is why you're not admitting defeat by working with a wellness way doctor, because we'll test things properly and we'll move you in the right direction, especially um, because I will tell you this, every wellness way doctor has the same clinical education that I do, um, you know, as well. And we learn every single week, every single week we are learning. And in fact, some weeks we'll learn for six, seven hours, you know, as well. Wellness way doctors are masters of physiology and they're also masters at testing. And on your journey towards health, it's okay to ask for directions. What do I need to do next? And if you refuse to ask for directions, you'll end up like most men, you'll end up lost and going in the wrong direction. And then you got to turn around. So if you want to get from point A to point B, the quickest way is to ask for directions, especially, and there's no shame in actually doing that. And that's why 
Um, we have our in-person inflammation event that's coming up Tuesday, March 12th. If you're from, from the Chicagoland area, please make sure that you go up to the top and register for this in-person event. We'd love to work with you. We would be honored to work with you. And it starts by taking that first step, taking that step in the, into the office because I'll guide and lead you in the right direction. And if you are from the contiguous 48 states within the continental United States, that in, doesn't include Hawaii, doesn't include um, Alaska, and it's not outside of the country, you can register for the inflammation webinar. And that's an opportunity for us to work with you remotely, okay? Uh, if you're from the Chicagoland area, come to the inflammation event. It's much easier. We have much more availability to work in person than online. And, and I will say this, at some point in the near future, the webinar will be going away. So please don't delay. And that's not some kind of weird, like space is limited. <laughs> no, it will at some point, we will run out of room pretty quickly. So make sure that you take advantage of that and do that uh, really, really quickly. So guys, neuropathy, biggest thing that I can tell you is check your blood sugars, thiamine deficiency, make sure your thiamine demands are much greater. Make sure that you're getting extra sources of thiamine. But in the meantime, make sure you're also working on lowering those sugars down, especially, okay? It's one of the biggest things that I can tell you is make sure that you work on lowering those blood sugars. And if you need help, get on the inflammation webinar and then I'll be happy to help you through there um, as well. So guys, if you have a topic that you'd like to hear next week, just let me know. Um, it may be a question and answer. I don't know yet. We'll see. Uh, but if I do do a topic, it will be good. <laughs> you will enjoy it, hopefully. And um, But give me a topic because we're always open for new topics because I want to know what you're interested in. Okay, I want to know what you're interested in. Uh, if we get enough people that will ask, then we'll consider that, obviously, as a topic. So guys, neuropathy, think of thymine, your increased thymine demands. Get your blood sugars under control. But as far as increasing supplemental thiamine. I think that it's actually a good idea. All right, guys, be well, be blessed. I'll talk to you next week. Make sure that you share this video as well. Thank you guys so much. I love and appreciate all of you. I'm honored that you would join me on this Monday night. And I'm even more honored if you share this with other people as well. Lend a helping hand. So it's so important to help those people. Sometimes helping people is just giving them the right information. So guys, be well, be blessed. And like I always say, remember who you are.